Imagine, demand and build a world transformed. Hello and good evening, everyone. Let's get started. Welcome to TWT 2020 and to this session, Building a Transatlantic Strategy, What Have We Learned from the Last Five Years? Thank you for joining us for this discussion on a Friday evening, or if like myself and Kelly are in the United States, a Friday afternoon. Uh, my name is Joe Guinan. I've got the pleasure of being the moderator for tonight's session. I'm the vice president of the Democracy Collaborative, which is a US think do tank working on building the democratic economy. And I'm joining you from Washington DC. Uh, and we've been very pleased to partner with TWT for the past few years. So feel free to visit our virtual stall on the TWT website if you want to know more about us. Before I introduce the session and the speakers tonight, I've been asked to share just a few announcements with you. Uh, first, to make the session more accessible, we'll be using a live transcription service called Otter. Attendees using Otter will have to follow a link and open the transcript as a separate window. The link will be shared in the chat box by a volunteer. And if you're having any difficulties with that, please do message the tech volunteer on the chat. Secondly, as I'm sure many of you are already aware, TWT is free for all, uh, but it's only made possible by the contributions of supporters. So if you are able, please do consider supporting TWT at theworldtransform.org slash support uh, to help them sustain their important work all year round. Lastly, we just wanted to mention a few principles for the chat. We want everyone to feel welcome in these spaces and for everyone's voices to be heard. So please do bear this in mind when you're engaging with chat. Please don't use inappropriate, rude, or unkind language, and please don't spam. Any participants who stray from these principles may be prevented from further posting in the chat and comment box, but let's all make sure that that doesn't need to happen tonight. If you have a question or a comment for one of the speakers on the panel, do fire away so we can include them in the question and answer session that we're gonna have uh, towards the end of the evening. So, now to begin. We're here to talk about the experience of the last five years in the United Kingdom and the United States, and to talk about the lessons that we've learned for long-term political strategy and how we bring about socialist change. That might seem a bit daunting at the moment, uh, given the overall outlook and the balance of forces that we're facing, with the defeat first of the Corbyn project and then of the Sanders campaign, and then what seems like since to have been a piling on of multiple overlapping crises, the COVID pandemic, exploding racial injustice, climate change. Given all of this, how do things stand for the left? What have we learned and what's the way forward? One friend who saw the session title was reminded of the apocryphal traveler in the Irish countryside who stopped to ask for directions and was told, well, I wouldn't start from here, but here is where we are. And there are important lessons that we can draw from the experience of the past few years. You'll all doubtless have heard that Lenin quote about there being decades when nothing happens and months where decades happen. And the last few years have certainly felt like the latter. We went from a situation in which there was horizontalist organizing and a shunning of traditional electoralist politics as the norm uh, to suddenly find ourselves in a position with Corbynism and Sandersism where a new generation of the left and some older generations flooded back into electoral politics. It was an audacious bid to take hold of not just traditional political parties, the Labour Party and the Democrats, but also to seize state power and bring about radical transformative political economic change. And for a moment, like previous occasions when the US and the UK have moved in tandem, like Thatcher and Reagan or the third way of Bill Clinton and Tony Blair, it seemed that there might be an opportunity to move in tandem once again on both sides of the Atlantic, but this time in the direction of a new economic settlement built on democracy and on a Green New Deal. It wasn't to be. On both sides of the Atlantic, these efforts have run into the sand. So what do we learn from this experience and from the fact that we ultimately failed? Where did we make advances? Where did we fall short? What might we have done differently? And what might we have faced if we had in fact succeeded? Most importantly of all, how do we now move forward? Are we doomed to oscillate between horizontalism and electoralism, or might there be a synthesis? Where does the experience of the last five years leave us? To discuss all of this tonight, we're fortunate to be joined by a brilliant panel of speakers, Mary Robertson, Kali Akuno, Laura Smith, and Richard Seymour. Let me introduce them. 
Mary Robertson is senior policy officer at the TUC, and prior to that was head of economic policy at the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn. In 2015, it was somewhat unclear what a radical Labour government might do if it actually achieved state power. But Mary's one of the people who, as much as anyone else, did so much to change that in the intervening period, helping develop a radical economic program, which is probably the most advanced of any in the advanced industrial world. It was truly extraordinary to be able to go to the office of the leader of the opposition and encounter a socialist thinker and economist of her caliber. She's a great friend, and I look forward to hearing her insights from the vantage point she had deep at the heart of the Corbyn project. Next is Kali Akuno, executive director of Cooperation Jackson and a star of previous years of The World Transformed, where he talked with us about radical municipalism. Kali knows a thing or two about moving forward under politically difficult circumstances, given his grassroots work over the long haul to bring about radical economic change and black empowerment in Jackson, Mississippi, surrounded by a sea of white supremacy, patriarchy, and racialized state violence. I think the last time I met Kali was at our Democracy Collaborative offices here in Washington when he came to talk about a book that he co-edited, Jackson Rising, The Struggle for Economic Democracy and Black Self-Determination in Jackson, Mississippi which is highly recommended. And we're looking forward to hearing Callie's views on the current state of the US left and the great struggles now underway and still ahead. Then there's Laura Smith, former member of parliament for Crew and Natwich from 2017 to 2019. And hopefully I dare say a future MP as well. Laura's a former primary school teacher and longtime activist. And one of those voices that we probably have done well to have listened more to given all the warnings that she gave us of what was to come in the so-called red wall seats over Brexit. She's now a councillor in Crew South, a contributor to Tribune magazine, and is working on a number of important initiatives, including No Holding Back with Ian Lavery and John Trickett, and also efforts on political education in working class communities, together with me and some other colleagues. On a previous occasion at The World Transformed, she famously used the platform to call for a general strike, so the bar has been set pretty high tonight, and I'm greatly looking forward to hearing what she has to say. Last but not least is Richard Seymour. Richard's well known to this audience as a writer and author and an indecently prolific author who um, has just brought out book after book in recent years. Um, he reminds me of what the late great radical journalist Alex Alexander Coburn used to say of himself, which was that he was faster than anyone better and better than anyone faster. Richard's been a really important voice on the transatlantic left, writing an early book on Corbynism, Corbyn, the rebirth of radical politics, and contributing a steady flow of forthright and insightful journalism and commentary. He's founder of the, uh, of the journal Salvage, which when it launched seemed to have a somewhat pessimistic and dismal title, uh, given the explosion of hope that was to come, but now seems prescient. And we're very fortunate to, fortunate to have Richard with us to sift through the wreckage of the recent past and the present moment tonight. So without further ado, we'll go to our panel for opening remarks from each of them, no more than 10 minutes each, and then we'll have some time for discussion and questions from all of you. Mary, please kick us off. Thanks very much, Joe, and thanks to TWT for organizing the event and for having me. Um, I want to start by just saying a few words about the nature of the defeat, because you know, what lessons we learn depends on what we think just happened, not just in, uh, in the election result, but over the last five years. Uh, there's a version of events that says that losing the election was a failure, sure, but we succeeded in shifting the debate, pushing the Labour Party to the left. Um, I have kind of want to be upfront that that's not where I'm coming from. I think leaving aside the question of whether the debate really has shifted, uh, if we're honest about what was the goal at the time, what we thought we were doing, it was socialism and we failed. Not just because we lost the election, but because socialism feels as far away now as it did in early 2015. Uh, so why? What went wrong? Um, yeah, at Joe's request, I'm kind of stepping back to take an overview here, and I'll point to three main lessons. Uh, so first of all, I think we surrendered to conventional politics far too much, especially after, 20, after the general election in 2017. Uh, we can see this in a number of ways. We turned inward to Westminster to play parliamentary games around uh, Brexit in the kind of winter 2018-19. We put party democracy on the back burner and sought repeated reconciliations with hostile wings of the PLP. Uh, we put narrow electoral considerations ahead of basic solidarity, for example, in relation to immigration. Uh, and ultimately our strategy collapsed into 
winning elections. Um, so there was no strategy beyond winning elections. And then in 2019, we proved not very good at that kind of electoral politics, which we saw in kind of a chaotic campaign, poor or non-existent messaging, a general failure to understand and prepare for what changed between 2017 and 2019. Um, all of these things, I think, I don't want to sort of rehash those electoral lessons because I don't think they're the most important, um, but I think they all point to uh, the fact that we were far more confident about what we were selling than about how we were selling it. Uh, second then, sort of to elaborate on that, uh, second lesson uh, is, I think, a huge over-reliance on policy. Uh, so Joe was very kind and generous about what we achieved in terms of policy development over the last five years. Uh, and I think he is right to point to the development of that programme as one of our collective achievements uh, as a, a kind of academic economist prior to working for Jeremy, uh, doing a lot of work on neoliberalism. I spent zero time thinking about what our alternative was. And so we put together a very substantial developed alternative very quickly. Uh, however, I think one of the key learns, lessons has to be that good and popular policies aren't enough. You know, that was clear from the election result. Um, but I think it's also got a during it signif enduring significance. Um, yeah insofar as essentially I'm sceptical of the significance of claims that we won the argument or we're the ones with all the ideas, uh, basically because I don't think politics is about arguments. It's about power and strength. Uh, if we sifted the debate, which we did at least for a period, uh, it's because we were seen as a threat, not because our ideas were compelling. If you want our ideas to continue to have a bearing, continue to influence politics in this country, we need to build pressure from below, demonstrate strength, not the strength of our arguments, but the strength of our movement. Uh, and that leads to what I think is the most important lesson, which is really the, the criminal neglect of movement building in our overall strategy and failure to realise that if you are engaged in the project, which, as I said, I think we were, of trying to build socialism through a conventional political party, uh, you can't do it through conventional political means. Uh, and that there are a number of reasons why this is the case. First of all, electorally, when you think of questions like how do you come and overcome an incredibly hostile right-wing press, uh, the answer can't simply be have better messaging or something like that. Uh, it needs to be about building trust, having a different strategy that doesn't just rely on the press, building trust and relationships in areas where you want people to both vote for you through sustained periods of solidarity building. Uh, I think movement building should have been just as strategically important to sustaining a radical, to the question of how do you sustain a government, a radical government once you're in power. Um, to, to illustrate this, I think it's quite a, an entertaining exercise to uh, think about how many coups there might have been if Jeremy had done what Johnson has done as, as PM since December. Uh, the, the serious point in that being we'd have needed a strategy to rebut that. We'd have needed you know, our own forces to overcome the enormous pressure that we would have been under had we won in December 19. And Joe and Christine Berry's book people get ready uh is extremely good at setting this out in more detail than i have time to hear so i just refer and encourage people to read that um and finally what i think is less discussed well not finally actually but what i think is less discussed uh is the importance of movement building to implement in our program so the the policy program is often dismissed as kind of bog standard social democracy uh and i think yeah, on the surface it is but what this interpretation misses is, um, excuse my language, but the transformative dialectic that was contained within it. Uh, what do I mean by this? So many of the policies uh, in our programme, nationalisation, industrial strategy with the scale of intervention that we were proposing, especially in 2019, community wealth building, all of these would and more would involve significant disruptions of the economic model. Uh, and when you're pursuing pathways that disrupt the current economic model, what emerges in its place is very dependent on what there is to build on. Uh, and this is where I think movement building would have come into it. So take economic democracy as an example. Uh, economic democracy, which is very central to our programme, uh, it's 
transformative. It's not just something, you know, a stroke of a civil servant's pen and you implement it. The very idea is to remake people as agents, reform our collective identities, uh, and in doing so, shift how power works in society. <laughs> but all of these characteristics of economic democracy, which is why we wanted it to be central to our program, why we made it central to our program, also made it very difficult to meaningfully implement uh, from from Westminster, from the top. It needed, if it would have required, had we been elected and tried to implement it, it would have required found strong foundations of collective activity as a starting point. Um, and finally, the other reason why movement building is important is I think the absence of a strong grassroots movement uh, has hindered uh, the ability of the left to regroup and continue to have influence um, since the election. Uh, so where does this leave us? Um, so that's my main conclusion, really, that all we can usefully do right now is to organise in our workplaces, union branches, communities. And the useful thing about that is it's true whatever your assessment of what the successes or failures of the project were, what the original goals of the project were, uh, what <laughs> whether it was uh, wise or not to attempt to pursue socialism through the Labour Party, so on and so forth. What we should be doing right now is organising at a grassroots level. Uh, there's lots of questions and challenges around our strategy in relation to this. Um, the distribution of activists across the country, the role of Labour councils, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But a crucial one uh, for this, and one I think we should be discussing in this se session, is understanding why movement building was so weak uh, over the last five years. I think part of the answer to that is that we were spoiled under Jeremy and John, whose instincts was very much to adopt all campaign demands and then some. You know, I think the conventional role for advisors, such as I was, is to be sent into meetings with stakeholders and activists, smile and nod and find a way to palm them off. Uh, what we were told repeatedly was find a way to do it. Uh, and that's, you know, that's, <laughs> that's great. That was exciting. Uh, but it also sort of excused us from the hard work of, of movement building and, and campaigning and developing that grassroots strength. Uh, I think an honest assessment would also say uh, that the project had a very top-down character. There was more emphasis on loyalty often than there was an empowerment. Uh, and there were good reasons why this was the case. Uh, a characteristic of neoliberalism is that it crushed institutions and squeezed the space for collective action and resistance. And this created a long-term feeling of powerlessness, disenfranchisement, uh, that meant that we often, I think, regulated or stifled our own criticism because we didn't want to jeopardise what felt like our one shot at changing things. Um, but it was also a fatal flaw, you know, for a movement, who, for a project who's, for which rebalancing power was meant to be our main aim, uh, saying we're deferring the rebalances of power to a last with one power, I think just doesn't work. And it led to activists shutting up when, in hindsight, they often had better instincts uh, than those making the decisions. Uh, it, it also meant that we didn't entrench grassroots power, which again has weakened us now. Um, finally, I think it's led to an enduring and frankly unhealthy lack of, that's my timer, so I'll just finish on this quickly. Uh, it's led to an, injury, an, an enduring and unhealthy um, lack of a culture of widespread debate about substantive issues and lack of a culture of healthy, constructive criticism. You know, in my view, you can't have a healthy movement uh, without widespread political education, understanding an agency. Uh, and in place of that, we've got a quite unhealthy culture in which a few individual commentators often act as intellectual arbiters or great gatekeepers. Um, often, frankly, don't respond well to criticism and have a vested material interest in maintaining that position. So as well as returning to local activism, grassroots activism, I think we need to see, think seriously about how to democratise debate and ideas formation within our movement. Um, yeah, one of the lessons of that really needs to be to have fewer former Westminster advisors speaking on panels. So that's a good time for me to shut up. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, and thanks for keeping to time. Lots to dig into there. Uh, but before we do, we're going to switch um, gears and uh, move across the Atlantic to Kali Akuno, who will give us the view of the lie of the land of the United States. Kali. Well, I want to thank Mary for just kind of jumping into it. Um, uh, there's a lot there that uh, I really appreciate it and definitely want to hear more of and, and uh, debate a couple of points. Uh, but let me just jump into uh, and, and share off the top 
kind of my perspective so folks know where I'm coming from uh, in offering my comments and giving, you know, a, a perspective. Uh, number one, uh, I have always maintained and continue to maintain uh, that working class and oppressed people have to build their own political organizations and institutions. Uh, and we have to represent ourselves in any and every arena of uh, political struggle. Uh, the electoral arena being one, uh, and that we should have our own parties and institution. Now, this is particularly um, different than I think historically might play out on the other side of the Atlantic, uh, where in the Labor Party kind of had some of that orientation uh, in its history. Uh, I think it's been somewhat, from my view, uh, uh, and it was part of, I think, uh, the, what happened to defeat somewhat captured by more middle forces uh, who definitely tried to, to steer their party uh, in a neoliberal direction. And I'm giving you that contrast uh, to say that I think one of the biggest errors um, made in particular by uh, Bernie Sanders was running with under the, the banner of the Democratic Party. Uh, I know I may be one of the few folks who you, you might listen to uh, who might hold this uh, particular view. Uh, most folks have articulated that if he hadn't won an, under that banner, uh, that he would have had probably no chance of, of becoming president. That's Bernie's view himself. Uh, but I think it misses the point of what Mary just really illustrated. Are we in this to try to uh, usher in uh, a set of, of broad kind of populist reforms uh, through the Democratic Party and in its, in its institutions? Or are we in this to movement build? Because if how you answer that leads you to different directions and different interpretations of what your program or strategy might be. Um, I think before looking or to understand, let me put it this way, to understand uh, the last five years and in this experiment, you really have to go back in the United States uh, a bit further. I think you have to really start this question uh, with the financial collapse uh, that happened in 2008 and then the four years it took to build viable social movements in response. Uh, so there was a union upsurge. Many folks might remember what happened in Wisconsin. Uh, then there was the, the Occupy movement, which was uh, also a transatlantic and a global movement, first starting uh, in Europe, you know, with some of the work that was being done in Greece and, and in Spain with the uh, indignados and then kind of hopping the water uh, and taking on an even broader international kind of characteristic uh, from Occupy Wall Street. Uh, it, and then you have to look at some of the other movements that emerged, uh, like the movement for black lives uh, and other things, intervention, uh, 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 particularly some of the different things from uh, indigenous folks, both in Canada, but also in the United States, the Ida No More movement. These were the things that put the winds in the sails of Bernie's campaign and gave it its movement character leading up to 2016. The campaign, uh, this go around, the 2019-2020 campaign really did not have that movement orientation that the first one did. And you can look at a number of different things in terms of uh, how the times had changed, how the, the animus had went from uh, initial kind of um, uh, thrust in, in 2016 uh, of being able to come in and usher in a kind of a populist social democratic uh, program uh, to one which was much more defensive in nature, which had to do with uh, primarily kind of getting out Trump. Uh, and I think if we look at that, uh, we see that large elements of the kind of the movement character what Bernie was building or was attempting to build and the forces behind him uh, were rallying to, uh, you see a major contrast between 2016 and 2020 uh, in terms of the campaign. Uh, and the, the piece around that that I think is most critical from, from my perspective uh, is that the, if the, in the United States anyway, the, the animus of being able to try to move anything towards the dial of socialism is only really going to come from concentrated power from below. And that power is well beyond the means of the traditional political force that exists within the United States. Um, and let me tell you why. Uh, uh, now, there's a, there's a long-standing uh, relationship uh, between the, the labor unions, particularly the AFL-CIO, and the Democratic Party. 
that alliance, if you would, uh, has critically been weakened by just the progression of events in the United States over the past 50 years. So much so that uh, by any good estimate, uh, organized labor in the trade unions only represent somewhere between 10 and 12 percent of the workforce in the United States, which means that close to 90 percent of working class people are not in any formal organization uh, that is rep represented within the trade union federation. So the, the trade unions federation to be able to kind of say it represents a broader kind of working class perspective or a broader working class membership and base in the United States is extremely limited and has been for some time. Uh, and so they have also, they've been basically surrendered because they don't have the power from the from below to really push in the institutional framework. What you have more within the United States now is a is a sector of kind of a social movement one, which is embedded in kind of the nonprofit organizing infrastructure and the growing part, which I think it speaks more to the horizontalism that was in question, uh, which is outside of, of kind of that framework and institution, which is the dominant thing that I would argue we are seeing in the United States today in places like Portland or Seattle or Oakland or Atlanta or DC or New York, like that dimension is what is uh, really kind of carrying the day and is drawing in the most energy, the most dynamism is pushing and challenging the question, but it's totally disconnected uh, in the main from the more organized traditional sector, either the nonprofits or the unions. Now, if we really want to move some things in this in this country, and I would say from what I heard from, from uh, Mary articulating, getting back to the movement building orientation as the animus of our focus and energy towards bringing forth a, a, a socialist agenda and program, that has to be our focus, I would argue. Um, and that means de-emphasizing, and this, this may sound a bit crazy, but we can talk about that uh, 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 in a bit in light of you know, the the kind of uh, what I call the Jacksonian challenge that Trump uh, really represents. Uh, it means doing the organizing and base building work uh, without the kind of the trappings of electoral fetishism, which dominate so much of the political landscape in the United States uh, around two year and four year cycles and really prohibit uh, in many respects, long term strategy, long term uh, perspective building, long-term organizing, uh, and that is ultimately what we're going to have to to get into if we're going to be able to challenge the growing strength of the right here in the United States, but also internationally. Uh, they, I would have to argue, even though they don't necessarily represent the numbers that I think that our, our side of the equation ultimately represents, but we have to be honest that we are being seriously out-organized. Um, uh, in almost every facet that you can look at in terms of education, in terms of institutions being built, uh, in terms of uh, effective uh, strategies, which are multi-layered and reach different sectors uh, of their base in, in, in the, the population. Uh, and we have to go back to our organizing uh, roots. And we have to do so uh, on the basis of trying to meet folks' material needs in the here and now. Uh, and that includes, from from our perspective, from my perspective, uh, doing the critical uh, economic development work on the grassroots level and building the, the the real alternatives that not only build elements of democracy and democratic practice and democratic subjects in our community, but actually tend to some of the concrete needs that folks have in our communities for housing, for uh, uh, food security. Uh, for a level of job security uh, and income and increasingly more education and healthcare, those things are becoming either inaccessible or more and more privatized. Uh, and these are the things that we have to get back into. And I think uh, one of the things that we've been advancing, I know the Democracy Collaborative has also been advancing this on both sides, uh, is really looking at this notion of organizing ourselves, organizing the working class and self and, and oppressed peoples uh, on the grassroots level to utilize our own resources, skills, energy, and strength to build our capacity to do this type of development work, which is not just only in the, the, the economic realm, but also definitely in the political realm, where we start 
uh, I would argue, uh, with the, the radical kind of municipal political projects that we need to do, and then looking from there, building solid bases, develop strategies where we can look more, both in terms of in, in the United States context, statewide, then regional wide, then nationally. Uh, that is the critical direction that I think we need to go. And I think it was, in many respects, from the perspective of success and failure, if you want to look at it that way, it was a it was a mistake for Bernie and a lot of the folks in that camp to try to replicate in 2020 what they did in 2016, when it was very clear that the, the, the DNC and the institutional forces of the Democratic Party were not going to allow Bernie to get anywhere close uh, to securing the, the nomination again. Uh, and we saw that uh, represented in the broad nature of the field that was posed against him from the beginning. Um, and then we, then we saw, and we can speak to it, I, I know my time is wrapping up, uh, the way in which uh, people were saying that in March, uh, Bernie made a comeback. That is the, the absolute wrong analysis. He had all of the institutional support uh, that he needed to kind of carry the day and, and move the election that was pretty much kind of baked in. Uh, but now I think the question is, was the historic mission of the Democratic Party fulfilled in March? I would argue that it is to a large degree uh, and that this makes uh, the question of, of the Biden-Harris ticket being able to win kind of the, the national election, it puts it seriously uh, into jeopardy because they have articulated a position which does not speak in a program, which does not all at all speak uh, to the base, right? Uh, if you just look at uh, the Green New Deal or universal health care and now defunding the police, they have all categorically rejected that. Uh, and therefore, I think rejecting the base, turning out and just saying that they, the, the only animus and all the reason why folks should turn out is because he's not the other guy. He's not Trump. That's not going to be enough. Um, I'll stop there so we can open it up. I know the time is short. We can get to more questions uh, later, but that's just to give everybody a kind of an opening feel to what I know we have to, to, to dive in deep and have a lot of debate and discussion in, uh, about. Thank you, Callie. So much there. And I think we're already getting a sense of not just similarities, but differences in the challenges that we face. The union density point, I think, is a really important one. Um, there's still something like a culture of the labor force um, in unions in the UK. Um, it's really down to 6% in the private sector in the right. US, and that's a different basis institutionally for politics. So we can dig into some of that in the, the discussion. Uh, next, we'd like to um, to turn to Laura Smith um, and hear the view from Crew and Natwich. Laura. Thank you, Joe. And um, wow, I've pretty much ripped up everything I was going to say because it, it's been said and far better, I have to say, than I would be saying it by both uh, Mary and, and Callie. And I think like you posed the question to me, um, what have I learned in the last five years? God, I have learned so, so much. I continue to learn so much. Um, I, I trust no one. That's one thing that I've definitely learned over the last five years. Um, but look, I think one of the things that was successful was the, the mass membership that was built up. Um, and it was, you know, we saw it with Jeremy, we saw it with Bernie. And they managed to kind of switch something on in people, in a lot of people who felt politically homeless. But I think where it was a success, we also failed because what we failed to do, um, and, and everybody on the left has to take responsibility for this really, is develop that political education that was desperately needed. Um, and that kind of uh, study and the theory behind the things that we want to see and the reason why we want to we want to see it and i think it's it's a real shame and that's what we need to change this time as we as we move forward um because the movement here it kind of really got going at the time of the financial crash we saw it building up then we had the jeremy campaign um there were lots of different organizations that were were really kind of doing so much all over the country and then Mary's right, um, Jeremy became the leader. Nobody was really, really expecting it. And I think a lot of people kind of thought, well, that's job done. And I think that's one of the, the things that I definitely learned. And I've obviously seen this from both sides, having, having been a member of parliament. We can't rely on parliament to deliver what we want. We just simply cannot. And I will go into a bit more detail about that. Um, what else is positive? Look, now I, I 
I'm proud to, to stand up and say that I am a socialist with socialist values. Isn't that long ago that if you said that in a in a crew and Nunswich Labour Party meeting, uh, well, you just wouldn't say it. You'd kind of sit in the shadows and, and keep fairly quiet about that. Um, so that's positive. And these people who, who wanted change, who need change, who were so behind Jeremy and the movement from the start, they are still there. And yes, people have um, a rightly feeling really pissed off about the whole situation, but it's up to us. We have to find the way to be able to ignite uh, people again, to be able to uh, reignite that spark, because we, we have to. We have to. There is no alternative as far as as far as I'm concerned. We have to figure it out. Um, so, yeah, I think one of the key things that we have to do moving forward is develop that political education. I think also, like Mary said, not relying on just a small group of people who think that they're really clever and know everything. We need to hear working class voices. Um, we need to make sure that working class people feel empowered to be able to be part of that discussion and to lead that discussion, because actually you can have a parliament filled with the brightest sparks in the whole country and they absolutely mess the whole thing up as we see time and time again. And um, for me, being able to get into Parliament, it was, it was something that I could never have imagined. I've, I've said this so many times. I was a working class person. I was a primary school teacher. I'd grown up in poverty in a household with, uh, you know, where it just wouldn't, we would just never have thought something like that could happen to me. I managed to get in there. And yes, it didn't last very long. I was kicked out sort of two and a half years later. Um, but still, I... I, I Parliament is part of it. In the way that our system works in this country currently, we can't ignore Parliament. So, yes, electorally, um, it does play a part in it. Who we have representing us does play a part. But for me, the biggest thing that thing that I have learned is that it's not the key. You can have um, plenty of people in Parliament with decent socialist values. And I do believe that there are some, uh, <laughs> albeit not that many. Um, but what can they actually achieve? Um, you can go out and make an, an incredible speech in Parliament, but how does that actually impact the lives of the working person or the person who's struggling in the community? And it's not through anybody, any fault of their own. It is the way the system works, because Parliament is designed to suck your energy and those people watching Parliament, their energy, into something that um, will stop them from organising in a grassroots way, um, stop them from going out campaigning um, and, and speaking to people. And I think this is where the trade unions are going to play such an incredible, um, it, it, it's such an important part. And yes, uh, isn't we're not in the same place as we we have been. We are uh, seeing we have seen numbers grow recently, but we know the trade unions also have uh, many issues that that have been going on. But if we're going to speak to working people, if we're going to organise and empower working people, then the trade unions are are really essential in that. Um, for me, why is the political education side of it so important? I don't think there's a, a better example, actually, than the massive mess that was Brexit um, in the Labour Party here. And me, when I um, entered Parliament, I'll be honest with you, I started in a place that was completely different with Brexit to where I ended up in my own head. But why is that? It's because I did an awful lot of reading. I wasn't an expert, but I made sure um, I represented people and I made sure that I had the debates. I asked the questions. I did the research so that I really understood how I could advance socialism um, in the way that I voted in the direction I was pushing. And the fact is, an awful lot of people who are in Parliament don't look at things in that level of depth. And I think we have to demand that of the people who are, are in Parliament. And we can only do that by developing our own political education. Um, so, yeah, I think we need to be looking at how we can develop book clubs, uh, podcasts, how we make all these things accessible, really kind of go back. And I think that's the other thing that we're, we're going to have to accept. It is going to take an awful lot of work, this. There isn't a quick fix to it. We want to take on an entire system. Um, and we saw Jeremy as a huge opportunity. But it was, um, you know, I don't know. We, we weren't ready for it at the same time. We just weren't. We weren't as an organisation um, ready for the things that were thrown up by, um, of course, a, a system that 
is is designed to make sure that capitalism stays very much um leading the way now i think that the movement um we started out boldly we've tapped into a lot of policies a lot of policies have been developed but we've got to put the groundwork in again to make people and the public understand why these policies will impact their lives so we need to in a positive way we need to to make it so that somebody at home is sitting there going do you know what they're absolutely right about a four-day week um that 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 should be uh, that that just makes sense but we haven't done that yet and, and we're going to have to if we're going to get people on side. And again, that's where this organising the political education, making sure we're deep rooted in our communities that we want to represent. That's where this um, all, all comes about. And, you know, we, we just we can't expect people to just come on board with our ideas when they have had for so long they've got a press that is pushing a certain agenda at them as well um you know this has been drip fed for such a long time we we're gonna have to find the routes uh, to navigate so that we have our voices heard in it and you can't just rely on on politicians to do that you simply can't um and look let's face it all the all the left has changed the way that people feel about um prejudice about personal identity and freedom and it it has to an extent exposed capitalism's cruelties in those areas but what um we fail to change fundamentally and i think this is key is how wealth and work function in society um and we've we've not really managed to provide a compelling vision of how that should be done um and the left in short we haven't sold an economic policy that people have been able to get get on board with. I think if we can do that, then we we can win. Because at the moment, uh, privatisation, deregulation, lower taxes uh, for businesses, um, more power for the employers and the shareholders, um, less power for workers. This is all stuff that a lot of people in the public just accept as being inevitable almost. And um, there, there, of course, has been an immense effort to make sure that capitalism appears inevitable and unchangeable. And we have to um, make sure that we are reaching out, putting the same amount of effort into changing people's uh, perception of that. And to look at things, um, you know, we've, we've got to take people on that journey. Workers are going to be experiencing um, some of the most the toughest, most horrible situations um, coming up due to due to what we're seeing across the globe. I, I hate to even imagine how desperate the situation for people is is going to become. Um, and we have to be there with an alternative vision because let's not beat about the bush. Why one of the biggest reason that this has happened is because capitalism cannot look after people. You know, it, it cannot prioritise the health and well-being of people over over profit and its shareholders and wealth um so yeah i'm, I'm not going to speak for too much longer because i want to kind of allow the questions but yeah in in kind of summary don't rely on politicians to have the answers um because they they won't i think we've seen in this in this country and and in the states as well with um the black lives matter um movement we've seen it with um, some of the child food poverty campaigns over here, when the public get behind something and they demand change, that is what makes politicians change. Um, because inevitably, when politicians are getting bombarded uh, left, right and centre and they become very unpopular, they don't particularly like that. So it's up to, if, if we can get the public to realise that the power that they have um then i think you know and that they can drive change but it is hard it is a struggle then then we can kind of move this forward and we have to just accept where we are too and it's really hard i f i find it you know day to day is a journey of how i'm feeling um because it's a huge disappointment um where we are now compared to where we were in 2017 uh when when i was elected but as the old saying goes we are where we are what else have I learned in the last five years? Um, well, I learned that calling for a general strike at a fringe event will cause um, meltdown 
and the vein in Tom Watson's head to, to practically pop um, live on screen. I've also learned that my facial expressions uh, have caused me masses of problems. So I, I've been working on trying not to give too much away my face. And fighting for socialism will mess up your life in, in many ways. But this is this is the struggle and we have to we we have to stick together and keep going. Um, there is no other choice. Basically, it's uh, it's either do that or give up and curl up and, and let these bastards win. And I, for one, certainly won't be doing that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. We certainly wouldn't want the vein to pop in Tom Watson's head. Um, but thank you for your words about politicians. I think it's fair to say that we all want a lot more politicians like you in the mix. And I think the political education point is really important as part of closing the gap between that program that Mary was talking about that we've developed and people being able to see their real material interest, interest reflected in it. And we failed in the, the two electoral tests in which we've tried uh, to do this on both sides of the Atlantic. So lots to dig into there. Uh, but before we do that, let's go to our final panelist, um, Richard Seymour. Richard. Hey. So <clears throat> I think you know, defeat can be um, an underrated experience um, and can be, in fact, quite enriching in some ways. Um, in particular, the longer you go on powered by hubris um, without attending to your fundamental weaknesses, the longer people can believe that those weaknesses don't exist, the longer they are exacerbated, the worse the ultimate strategic defeat will be. So we should take defeat as an opportunity, first of all, to destroy our illusions. But before I go on to, you know, what what those illusions might be uh, from my perspective, I do want to say I think it's important to register that the left has made some progress uh, since 2015. Um, it inherited an enormous weakness in its organization, to wit, there wasn't really much organization to speak of. Um, uh, you know, certainly the Labour left uh, didn't seem to have much of an organised presence in national political life. Um, it was hard to believe that the Labour left even existed at that time, although it did. Um, the extra Labour left um, was organised in group of schools that were falling apart. There were very few um, publications that registered or made a difference. Um, there were a handful of articulate spokespeople um, who you know, necessarily uh, would be pulled somewhat to the right um, by the surrounding culture. Um, so there weren't many organic intellectuals, as Gramsci would say. Um, there, there, you know, there, there was um, uh, very little in terms of a sustained media presence. And there was also, it has to be said, very little um, social depth or rootedness in the labor movement, which, uh, although it's not in as parlous a condition as the United States, uh, has been losing uh, density um, and uh, in terms of activity year on year. Uh, what I mean is, you know, it's um, it's you know it's it's very good that we have such uh, strong union representation in the public sector. But the problem there is that nine out of ten uh, private sector workplaces have never seen uh, a shop steward, um, let alone a picket line. So that's that matters to people's consciousness. It matters to how people understand and apprehend class politics. They may have a sense of their own class position, but uh, without some sort of organized force that can give them, uh, uh, that can subjectify them, give them a sense of their, their, their role in class politics, then nothing will come of that. So that was a huge weakness. Um, and it has to be said that some of those weaknesses have uh, been improved on. I don't think um, the position of trade unions has improved except in regard to internal Labour Party politics. And I think that was obviously the gambit that Unite et al. made in backing Corbyn back in 2015. Uh, but nonetheless, we have more publications. We have the world transformed. We have momentum. Um, we have um, some fairly successful organizations like Novara's uh, exploded in recent years. Uh, you know, I don't want to exaggerate all this, but these are real, real um, organizational forces that matter for us. Um, they're raw material to work with to some extent. So. What's the number one lesson that I would say we've learned from all this? Because we've made more progress in the last five years uh, than we have previously, notwithstanding that we experienced a huge and momentous defeat. First of all, parties matter. 
vanguardism is unavoidable. I'm sorry to use the Leninist idiom, but actually it's not really even a Leninist point, this. Um, Rodrigo Nunes, uh, in his book about social movements and networks, talks about this. Um, and to, to some extent, you know, wherever you have an organizing core, you have a small group of people, a minority, um, taking the initiative and setting priorities, and that's just unavoidable. And parties actually seem to work quite well. The anti-party prejudice, um, notwithstanding the fact that Labour is not necessarily the best example of a functioning party, there's all sorts of problems with Labour. However, parties uh, can be quite useful. Anti-party prejudice that we inherited from uh, the end of the Cold War, um, I think, was misplaced. Uh, however, the fact that, uh, you know, and this you can see this as a kind of contrarian defense of top-down organizing given what we've heard about you know the necessity for grassroots organizing um i'm not against uh, top-down organizing at all the problem there is however it can um uh let's say uh, lead to certain forms of substitutionism what i mean by that is small groups of people um uh, imagining that they act on behalf of uh the wider movement and thus the wider uh, I don't know, the wider class, uh, the wider political tendency or whatever. Um, and that can lend itself to all sorts of hubris and voluntarism and so on. Um, another thing is that brands matter. Notwithstanding anti-political currents of, uh, abroad, the Labour brand was still incredibly powerful, uh, much more so than I would have expected, because I remember campaigning in 2019 uh, with people who, you know, young people, um, don't let me say that like an old fart, but young people uh, wearing labor badges and hats and scarves um, and being really proud of it. When I was being politicized as a student, no young person would have touched the Labour Party. It was something to be regarded as, yeah, OK, get them in, you know, um, but, to, you know, nobody would want to identify with them in that way. And certainly after, uh, you know, the anti-war movement and everything, that, that was gone. So. Um, the Labour brand still remains quite surprisingly powerful. That said, uh, the potential for a rupture was missed. Uh, obviously, since 2014, the Scottish independence uh, referendum, Corbyn's uh, uh, leadership victory, uh, the Brexit uh, result, uh, the referendum, the uh, 2017 general election, there's been evidence of gathering forces towards some sort of political rupture in the United Kingdom. Um, that rupture was missed by the left. That's the great tragedy. We were not able to shape it in uh, the direction that we wanted. And so therefore uh, it has been won by the forces of what I'm calling disaster nationalism, sort of death wish right. Um, but why? Why did we get it so, uh, what, why did uh, the right um, seize the initiative on this uh, more than the left did? Well, I think labor economism, traditional labor economism actually won the day here, uh, leading to evasion and passivity on a number of rather important issues. I think it's significant and salient that if you think of the issues where uh, Jeremy Corbyn and his allies, the leadership and so on, were ideologically the weakest, Brexit, Scotland, anti-Semitism, police, free movement, uh, all that stuff, um, uh, you know, they were the, 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 the least likely to take an aggressive, combative stance. Um, those are issues that have to do with the state, nation and race. Traditionally, areas where labour has been weak and where the, the UK left, I think, as a whole, has been quite weak. Um, there was um, an inability to recognise that Brexit, uh, in whatever complex ways, condensed issues that were class issues. Constitutional issues are class issues. doesn't matter whether you're... Uh, leave will remain. I, I don't pretend there are any simple answers to that. But uh, when Jeremy Corbyn put out leaflets saying, let's uh, bring the country together, the country didn't want to come together. Um, and uh, that was a completely the wrong message to send. But it reflected the hope that all of these divisive issues that were orthogonal to the traditionally perceived left-right divide could be sort of shunted aside, marginalized. So we wouldn't have to fight through them. We wouldn't have to fight, uh, for example, in the case of anti-Semitism allegations, for the full complexity of the truth. I'm not saying, you know, just fight to clear Labour's name against the absurd charges, of course. You know, I'm saying fight for the, the, the full concrete realities of the situation, um, uh, including a, a, an element of acknowledgement that, yes, there, there are some forces of anti-Semitism abroad on the left, uh, even if they don't characterize the majority, um, and so on. Okay. 
Um, there's another problem here, uh, which is um, that we had um, faith in leaps. It's one thing to take a leap of faith, but um, because so much of what happened uh, to the uh, left in the last few years happened seemingly out of nowhere, and we formed quick contingent analyses of you know why that all happened, um, uh, these analyses, of course, quickly went out of date because the conditions changed. But um, when you don't understand, um, you know, why these things are happening, um, you only have a dim intuition, it can appear almost miraculous. Um, so we developed a faith that we could make sudden leaps, and that led to a certain hubris. Um, I think we also overestimated the salience of the number of members that we had. Um, uh, to, again, uh, provocatively cite Lenin, better fewer, but better sometimes. Because the majority of the membership, I'm not saying we should want to get rid of them. Uh, I'm saying the majority of the membership was mostly passive, not doctrinally to the left, looking to the left, but not, uh, you know, uh, educated or indoctrinated in that way, particularly. Um, broadly speaking, there was very little effort to politically educate the mass of the membership. There was a low quality of discussion on key issues like Brexit, for example. Um, and that contributed to some of the, the defeats of the membership, uh, particularly on membership democracy. Um, and that's important given that the membership, the, uh, you know, the, the, you know uh, the, the majority that Corbyn had in the membership was his bulwark. It was his base. It was his biggest strength in the Labour Party. Uh, and when he couldn't rely on that, well, naturally, he relied on more conservative trade union bureaucrats. Um, Powerlessness, uh, you know, for the um, active minority of members and the fact of uh, being defeated and losing the battle on membership democracy led to some hubristic backlash. I think some of that was visible in the 2019 uh, conference. Uh, you know, I'm not suggesting that uh, we shouldn't have fought for the Green New Deal, etc., but we should have recognised that the policies that were won in the 2019 conference, pushing Labour fairly far to the left of where it had been, um, were won by a small minority of activists and didn't really represent any groundswell uh, shift in the wider society. And that was a problem when it came to the general election. Um, I could go on here, but I've got to wrap up. So final thing, um, we are in a volatile era, which means that although it's dangerous and terrifying and the forces of disaster nationalism are abroad, uh, there's a lot of apocalyptic feeling on the right, uh, a lot of them are armed um, and ready to, to, to gun people down, as we're seeing in the United States, uh, but it won't just be in the United States. However, it's also, um, to that extent, also kind of fertile terrain for new configurations and new possibilities, and we should pay close attention to that. Uh, but this enjoins upon us, um, you know, the experience of defeat enjoins upon us three things. One, obviously a degree of humility. So when I talk about the illusions that were shattered, uh, often these were my illusions. Um, so I think we should start from that position. We've all been very, very wrong, proved very, very wrong over the last few years at one point or another. Second, experimentalism, because we don't know what's going on. There's a huge area of the unknown, and that's actually a hopeful thing. Uh, there, if, if there is hope, it lies in the unknown. Finally, um, and this is a slightly opaque thing, I suppose, but I just want to finish on this. I would like defeat to foster in us um, what sometimes is called a tragic consciousness. What I mean by that is a certain skepticism about, uh, you know, manic pleas for optimism and creativity and go out there and build it and so on, and a recognition that people are what they are, and that includes people being flawed, and that includes people having limited energy, that includes all sorts of things. And it also would um, mean that we would be less inclined to pursue some of the more extravagant forms of woke uh, politics, which can degenerate into absolute online debacles. And uh, it probably would le lead us to be less inclined to spend our time on the internet, uh, you know, trolling Matt Chorley or um, some other uh, numpty that we've taken a dislike to. This is all displacement activity. We should be aware that um, we are um, all um, human, which includes, uh, you know, everything awful that goes with being human. And perhaps that would lead us to take a more uh, cautious approach to um, sort of uh, to our hubris. All right, I'll leave it there. 
Thank you so much, Richard. Them's fighting words. Um, things are far too uh, bad and it's far too late for pessimism, as the phrase goes, and, um, and, and certainly that can orient us. Um, so now I think um, there's so much on the table here that, um, that maybe we'll take a few minutes and see if, um, if the panel have got questions or things they want to discuss with each other based on, on all that we've heard so far, the, um, the surrender to traditional politics, the failure of, of movement building, and the need to really go back and build our own institutions at the, the grassroots, whether that's um, parties or, uh, or other institutional forms, and we can dig in on that. The role of unions has come up, and we'll turn to some of those questions maybe in, in the Q&A as well. Uh, but also um, the need for political education, the potential to work at the local level um, now that we're running into um, into difficulties at the national level. Um, the, um, the fact that our economic policy program didn't really speak to people and that there's a gap there that, that we really need to close. So maybe... Um, what I'd like to do is just go through you all in the turn in which you spoke and just give you an opportunity for a minute or two to reflect on anything that anyone else has said or add anything to your remarks um, based on having heard everybody. And then we'll go to some of the questions that are coming in um, through the chat. Mary. Um, right, thanks to everyone. Uh, really great uh, contributions. Um, and I think surprisingly large amount of agreement as well. Uh, I don't have much to add. I guess the one thing that I'd like to add, especially after listening to everybody else, is uh, a bit of a note of optimism. Um, and yeah, I think my contribution was quite pessimistic. I think that's yeah. I think in many ways it's important given the uh, given the scale of defeat. Um, but I think. Uh, I think it was Richard who said, but forgive me if I'm disremembering that. We are in a time at the moment where it feels like um, <laughs> the world is more and more and more in line with a particularly vulgar form of Marxism. <laughs> and as overwhelming and scary as that can be, sometimes I do. Sometimes I do also think that opens up opportunities, and it opens up opportunities very quickly. And if I can sort of reframe my concluding words in a more positive note rather than sort of uh, deriding uh, the state of the movement. Uh, I think what I'm saying is actually really positive insofar as it's a call on people to have more faith in each other and themselves, uh, to believe in our collective power um, and to take matters into our own hands. Um, I think the hardest thing about learning those lessons, the, the lessons that we're all in different ways encouraging people to learn is that it does imply things are much harder. Um, the appeal of winning the leadership of a major party is it does make it feel like change can happen very quickly. And when we're talking about movement building, I don't think we're, uh, I mean, I, I won't try and speak for others or speak for myself. I don't think we're talking about uh, well, let's you know, let's focus on organising our areas, and in that way, we'll Im implement our entire economic program and, and build socialism. Uh, really, we're saying yeah, we've got a lot of hard work to do before we're in a position to get to where we, what we felt like might be close, what might be quite close in December, um, and probably wasn't as close as we thought it was. Uh, but you know, movement building initially means small incremental changes. It means focusing on single issues and building co in, the, in probably in like often in local areas and building coalitions initially that support them and hoping that they, that those coalitions can uh, firm up into something stronger. Um, it means fighting particular battles in the workplace. It doesn't mean bringing down the government straight away. It doesn't mean rolling out an entire socialist ec economic program straight away. Um, so that's the kind of, that's the challenging side. But the positive side is, I think, uh, at the core of what we're doing is having more faith and confidence in ourselves. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Mary. Callie, any reflections? Uh, plenty. Um, what we have time to, to kind of share uh, may be limited. I, I'll, I'll say this based on what uh, all I've heard. Um, I, I don't think we draw enough from the lessons of the 20th century uh, enough. Uh, I think a lack, uh, a, a large part of our kind of lack of confidence that Mary spoke to uh, has been uh, largely framed over the last 20, 25 years uh, is trying to 
uh, either ignore what happened in the 20th century, you know, both on the relative to the Soviet experience, but also to the social democratic uh, experience in, in most of Europe and other parts of Latin America, et cetera. Uh, and I don't think we use the hard lessons learned from that experience enough to really shape going forward. And as a result, I think we tend to try, we tend to make and have been making, I think the last 10 years, many of the same mistakes uh, in the social democratic experiments of the early of 20th century. We, we kind of repeated those um, uh, in assuming that we were really ready to um, engage really the forces of capital through a kind of a weakened position relative to the state and we didn't have enough of our own base consolidated and organized. And I just want to reiterate that there is no substitute and there is no way around us organizing our own folks and organizing them around their own interests and having folks understand that and then being ready to act upon that. And I think a lot of times, I, I know I can share in my experience, I think in some of the things we did here, here uh, in Jackson relative to the electoral arena, even though we actually you know, won some city council seats. We won the mayor's uh, election. Uh, we actually did a bit of leapfrogging that we got a little bit further ahead than where the actual base was um, and what prepared to do. And then, then as a result, uh, once the forces of capital and the forces of right kind of struck back, the compromises uh, were in their era, in, I mean, in, in their favor and not in ours. Uh, you know, because it was it was hard to either sustain the level of personal engagement that, that got people elected, and then there was often kind of a, a breathing or a sigh of relief that now our elected officials are going to handle. You know what the, what what we couldn't do in the movement, or you know we we work so hard to get them there, we can kind of sit back and relax. That's not uh, what's really going to uh, win the day, and I, I hear that replicated in some of the things um, here. Uh, and then the last thing I'll speak and, you know, just say, um, I saw on some of the questions, uh, there is a set of things that we call it, we're, we're calling now more from our, our build and fight program, you know, practices of positionality, the things that we need to do uh, uh, that to build our strength over time so that we not just can demonstrate, you know, better ideas, which are more democratic, more egalitarian, more inclusive but actually demonstrate and practice how they work, right? And, and I'd love to speak to some of those a little bit better, but that is where I think going forward on both sides, as I see it, uh, I think we need to reposition ourselves in the next decade going forward. Yeah, we meet multiple challenges also as well, because you know, there's a concrete need for our side to have power in very soon. I'm just not gonna lie, let's, let's cut the chase on that, because we're facing some major calamities coming down the pipeline. And the right's response is basically to let the vast majority of us wither and die because they think that they're going to just live either on the hothouse planet or go to Mars, and that's going to be the solution. Uh, and clearly it's not. Laura, bringing you in, I don't know if there's anything you want to highlight or add or maybe even also to respond to that point of Callie's and the sort of vacuum um, that the right is stepping into. And we're seeing all manner of conspiracy theories and um, anti-mask stuff and so on exploding across the board. And in some ways, that's the vacuum that we've left by not doing some of that political education work you were talking yeah, about. But anything, anything you want to bring in at this point? Yeah, I agree with a lot of what Callie was saying then. And I think also um, when when Richard was saying about the amount of time we waste kind of on social media, and we're all guilty of it, I am as well. Um, and I think the other thing the left's been really good at is just talking to itself. Um, it's always great to go to an ACE rally and have loads of support, but nothing's going to change if you're just talking to the same people. And I think people have to accept as well. If I take, for example, uh, my hometown of, of Crewe, um, it's a held back community. We have had an awful lot of shit to put up with here. Um, lots of job losses over a long period of time, a lack of investment, a lack of uh, educational attainment. And um, the result of that is that you might hear some things off people that you don't particularly like or you don't particularly relate to, but that's their lived experience. And you've got to find a way of being able to talk to them without making them feel like shit, which, to be quite frank, I think a lot in the Labour Party have been quite good at doing on the, 
it sometimes um and and try and kind of you've got to start at a place where you're willing to listen to them and then um get them to understand what it is you're saying and and bring them on that journey with you so yeah we've got to stop talking to ourselves basically i do think that it's it's totally normal for us to be in um you know we we can we need to analyze what went wrong we need to understand it we need to do that work and properly um but i think also you know like Callie says a lot of this stuff has happened before if you go back and read what was happening in the 80s in in british politics a lot of the stuff that has come up now came up then and we need to start learning the lessons because we are seriously running out of time on this um it is quite time critical it's time critical in many ways we've got the populist right on the march and then climate change um is rearing its head ever more clearly the skies around san francisco have gone kind of blade runner red at the moment um and, and the clock terrifying. is counting down absolutely terrifying Richard, let me bring you back in and you're free to respond to any of that, but also I wanna start feeding in questions that we're getting from the chat. And one of them um, I think speaks to where you were going with the end of your remarks. And in what ways do you think the culture war contributed to the failures of the left and how can the left change the terms of the culture war going forward? Um, well, um, there's a few issues here. First of all, um, to some extent, Culture wars are unavoidable because, um, you know, one of the patterns under capitalism is that growing areas of life are politicized. So, you know, I mean, if if you regard, for example, sexism, transphobia, or racism as cultural issues, really cultural as uh, Judith Butler put it, then um, we can't really avoid that. Um, but it seems to me that rather than um, Rather than address those things uh, with the terms of kind of class analysis, if you like, or at least a materialist analysis, um, what we get caught up in is certain kinds of um, tribalism. And that's very visible on the internet. It's very visible on what I call the social industry, you know, uh, where our social life is turned into data generated profit, you know. Um, basically the way in which we contribute to the industry's profits is by getting outraged and going on and typing a lot of stuff. Um, why do we type a lot of stuff in order to uh, define ourselves against bad things? You know, define ourselves against transphobia, sexism, racism, etc., etc. And, and none of this uh, performance, to my mind, uh, necessarily contributes to the act of destruction or dismantling of systems of oppression and hierarchy. Um, so there's um, a problem there, but it's not uh, it's not a problem of um, uh, one where we can just uh, ignore um, cultural terrain. It's rather how we do that. For example, um, you know the struggle over um, trans rights is a material one. It's to do with healthcare. It's to do with state power. It's to do with um, your um, rights as a, you know, in a, in a sort of democratic society. These are all issues that I would recognise as class issues. However, um, what you get on the internet is, you know, you know, uh, trolling J.K. Rowling, who, you know, I, I don't doubt that she's a transport, but that doesn't really advance anything. It doesn't get us anywhere. So it's that kind of culture war that I think is the problem. And I think that the um, the social industry accelerates that. It's in a way, it's a cultural accelerator. It produces little tribes of people who, um, uh, you know, ossify and harden in their stances through battle with one another. And every time you get one of these big furores like Gamergate or Berthergate or one of these things, it's a new form of reaction that comes out of it. MRA, Trumpism, whatever. Um, so that's something that we need to be very wary of. But I think, you know, the, fundamentally, um, I, I go back to, I, I, I agree with what Mary Robertson said, we don't do enough organizing, whether it's in the workplace or in the community. That's fundamental. Thanks, Richard. 
next we want to take a question on on leadership and the gerontocracy um, as it's being described which I think we all understand if we look at the fact that the leaders that we had to turn to on both sides of the Atlantic for these movements um, Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn um, are both um, advanced in their years shall we say and so the question um, that we've got is about how to support young leftist politicians um, and where is the next generation of leaders coming from I'm actually going to direct this one to um, to Laura um, and to, to see if you've got thoughts about how we, we identify and grow those leaders um, from the movement and from our communities. And then next we'll go to Kelly with a question um, about local government. Yeah, so I think um, you have to be out there speaking to people in a in a big range of, of ways. I'm involved in this No Holding Back initiative. We did a Zoom tour all over the country. Um, we've been listening to trade unionists, to uh, people in the party, um, lots of different people. They didn't have to be in the party, and and hearing what they had to say, and and naturally, those people kind of start getting involved. They you you can spot people who who do have potential. There's loads of potential out there. Listen, if you want a, an example of how things can change, in 2017, I was um, a primary school teacher, a school cuts campaigner. Um, I held a couple of protests in my hometown that I managed to organise and get quite a lot of people there. That was in the February 2017. And, and by that, uh, that election, that year in June, I'd managed to go from part-time teacher pissed off at the world to in Parliament pissed off at the world. So it can be done through through organising. And, and really, how did it happen? Um, I don't know. People people obviously did spot something, something in me that, that could do it. And I think I'm not. People say to me all the time, oh, are you going to stand again for Parliament? Maybe my constituency party won't want me to stand. There's plenty of people who um, who could have that, who could go and have that voice. So, yeah, you've just got to, it's, again, it's just, it's the same thing for me. It's through organising, it's through linking up trade unions, getting working class voices in there. Um, I personally don't want my politicians to be just coming through this school of parliament. Um, I want my politicians and people who are speaking to represent the places that, that they're from. I want them to understand real life experience. I don't think that's too much to ask. But if you look, I think currently at our parliament, we have um, the smallest number ever, like 7% or it's seven uh, people, I think who have come from traditional working class backgrounds. We've got more Tories now who are from ex-mining backgrounds than we have um, Labour MPs. I mean, something's gone seriously wrong in, in my head with that. Thank you, Laura. Um, and so turning, Kelly, to the question that you raised really in, um, in your comments about, um, about building power um, from the bottom up and about the different institutional forms um, and approaches we can take to that and thinking of the work that Cooperation Jackson has been doing. And also you mentioned our work at the Democracy Collaborative around community wealth building, which is now uh, unfolding on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, there's a question about how local government um, can be reconfigured to really start to build upon some of the responses that we've seen, including to COVID, mutual aid groups, uh, direct forms of, of participation and other ways of, of prefiguring the kinds of societies that we want in terms of social relationships. So what are um, what are some of the ways that we might move forward um, at the local level? Well, I'm glad you, you'd mentioned um, what's happening with COVID-19 um, because, you know, I'm, I'm not as uh, fully aware of what's happening on the UK side. Um, but here in the United States, there was a tremendous flowering of mutual aid uh, work that, that just uh, took off in um, March, April, May. Um, and I thought this was one of the most critical developments, honestly, everybody in, in, here in, in the audience, on the US side, uh, really in about 20 years, if not even longer. Uh, because what it really pointed to was Social solidarity isn't dead. Despite neoliberalism, which I see as a deep reactionary cultural project, you know, that Richard was talking about, um, this spoke that people still had it within themselves uh, to seek each other out and to support each other 
in critical times of need. And that is something that we have to build upon, I think, in a systematic way. Um, I think the, the some of the things that we've been trying to identify around the building fight, we're saying that it's, it really has to start uh, with this mutual aid work, because that is concretely, at least on this side of the, the equation, um, that is where literally millions of p people are at. And in the in the foreseeable future, with so many millions of people in the United States uh, being unemployed, it's where we're going to have to go in a critical way in our organizing model to be able to meet many folks' basic needs. And you can see the ongoing continuation of that that need uh, in in the just any major food giveaway that happens now in the United States in any major city. There are lines around the block that happens here in my community and almost everyone that that I see. Uh, and there are layers of working class people that are there and they are, they are not being, for the most part, engaged in any sustained political dialogue or, or conversation. And they sh absolutely should be. We need to be having real conversations, ascertaining how people are seeing this moment. You know, what are their needs outside of the food needs? Because, you know, if you have a food need, there's usually a medical need, there's a housing need, there's et cetera. And then start having conversation that we can enable folks to 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 take this active role in helping us and us helping ourselves to move forward toward the productive end of that, not just the receiving end of that. And that is where you know I think that the the work that's happening in a lot of different communities, where there's already a, you know a ton of community gardens or connections, or, I think the folks are being uh, are tied into some of the suburban and, and the rural farms. Uh, particularly here in the United States, um, and then the, the work of the solidarity economy and all the co-ops have been emerging. We need to be politicizing that work, and it's, it starts with being in concrete dialogue around meeting people's objective needs. So in the United States, I can tell you, like in a place like Mississippi, the little things that we've been able to do, you know, which hasn't been the scale because of COVID-19 to the, to the degree that we wanted to, but we've been able to reach you know, just through our some of our basic work in this arena, to reach many uh, of white forces who we've been able to move off of some right leaning orientation just from basic human contact and sustained conversation. And the fact that the fascists are not the only people talking to them is of major critical importance and could be of some critical life and death in our environment in the weeks and days ahead. So I just want to outline that and 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 I. The, the other piece, really, where and how municipalities can get involved, um, it, it, that really depends on the strength of the social movement that's in your area. You got to put that first, I would argue, rather than necessarily what the municipality can do. And I'm saying that because if there isn't a strong movement, and, and we've learned this here in Jackson, when our movement is weak, the state government can come in and, and just slap all, all kind of restrictions on us. When the movement is strong, they still try to do that, but there's a fight back and there's a push and we find creative ways to get around the restrictions the federal or the state government in our case tries to impose upon us meeting direct needs. And then once we have that, um, policy creativity flows very easily. <laughs> You know, without it, people tend to stick, well, I can only do it this way, or this is what the book says, as opposed to, you know, in our case, where there's some some things, that remarkable things that have happened, in my view, on a municipal, municipal, uh, municipal level in the context of COVID-19, is the city has found a number of different ways to make public spaces available, you know, uh, and, and uh, be they police stations or the fire stations, that enables civil society groups to come in and do some of the work that the state has prohibited them from doing. So they can say, you can't de deliver mass, which is something they did here in Mississippi because the, the, the government, the municipal government, Chokwe Antar's government was giving out some masks and they tried to ban that. So we can get around that by saying, okay, we can just make the space available and allow the civil society groups, quote unquote, to come in and do that, that same work. That's the way we've been able to kind of reach scale, but it's because of the growing strength of the social movement kind of being back on the rise here. And I just want to put that out so folks clearly understand like where I think at this juncture of the road, our side of the equation needs to be centering its focus, energy, and attention. Thanks, Kelly. 
got a question for Mary, and then I think we'll just go to a closing minute each for um, for each of the panel. Um, and Mary, I know you can't call for a general strike because you work at the TUC, um, but there are, um, are a couple of questions that we've had um, on trade unions, um, one of which was really about whether the unions could have played a different role in the period between 2017 and 2019 in really mobilizing to bring down the government or were some of the issues that they faced similar to some of the problems that we've talked about um, in, in the Corbett project. And then the other question on trade unions that came in was really about their role um, in COVID and what could they be doing more proactively in terms of defending workers' rights and, and building the movement in response to the COVID challenges. So anything you want to say on either of those within um, your, your personal capacity or otherwise? Okay. Um I'm very wary of uh, setting myself against Laura, so you might want to bring her in afterwards to disagree with me. Uh, but because I think my simple answer is to whether trade unions could or should have mobilised between 2017 and 19 to bring down the government is no, <laughs> they couldn't have, and therefore they shouldn't have. Um, which, by which I mean simply the popular support, I think, for that kind of intervention didn't exist, and it's would have been foolish to set the trade union movement against the mass of popular opinion. Uh, and I think that sort of reflects the relative, uh, yeah, the limitations of the movement more generally. I don't think it follows that they are therefore beset by exactly the same challenges as Labour. And I think this, this sort of leads us into what's happened under COVID, where, um, again, this kind of question of should the trade union, why couldn't the trade unions bring down the government if Labour couldn't do it, is, is sort of seeking a quick fix in a way that is just reflective of how politics actually works, unfortunately, and frustratingly. You know, what we've seen during the COVID crisis is trade unions playing an incredibly valuable role in winning sick pay, protection, PPE, um, better health and safety in workplaces across the country, um, but often through not through sort of grand mobilizations, but through having been well organized in their workplaces. You know, we know that workplaces that are unionized have been much safer and done much better during COVID. Workers who are in a union have been safer during COVID. Um, and I think that's an illustration of the really valuable kind of uh, local grassroots or locally based organization that trade unions are really good at in the areas where they are strong. Uh, as Richard said, you know, trade union representation in the private sector is far lower than it should be. And that's a huge challenge. Um, but yeah, I think I've, I think I've answered everything there. Thanks, Mary. Um, so I think we're coming up on time. So I just want to give the panelists each a, a minute each for final reflections. And we'll start, Richard, um, with you. Um, any any last thought you want to leave people with on these broad questions that we've been digging into? Yeah, um, I, I mean, I just want to um, uh, say something about um, the importance of political leadership. Um, when Jeremy Corbyn, uh, for all his immense strengths, his historical consciousness, his unflappability, his resilience, all of that, um, on some key issues he wasn't leading. Um, that's really important um, uh, to, in terms of where we ended up, because actually it's, it's unfortunate in many ways that we live in a, a, a period of time in which um, personal uh, leadership uh, really matters. I wish it didn't. I wish we were much stronger at the base, but it does. Um, and to that effect, I think uh, a, a sort of um, a, a thought that follows on from that is that uh, the mistake that Corbyn made was one, uh, or one of the mistakes that he made was one that he couldn't avoid making, which was uh, in line with this uh, so-called politics of kindness. Um, he was called a populist. I think this is wrong. He was not a populist. He is a peacemaker. He believes in democracy. He believes in decentralizing. He believes in, you know, uh, uniting people if possible. Um, and so he's not somebody who goes out to, you know, incite uh, popular division which is really, frankly, uh, what we needed. Uh, we needed a bit more of what uh, Sanders was sometimes willing to do. Um, and um, we needed a bit more aggression. Um, and I think that uh, if we want to think about how we build political power in the future, we can't, I, I, you know, I, I don't think we can avoid the leadership question. And we want to think about 
well, what kind of leadership do we need? Um, unfortunately, we have to take into account things like charisma, uh, national media, and we have to take into account things um, uh, the ability to be aggressive and to uh, be uh, not just strategically aggressive in the ways that the Corbyn movement was, so to say, uh, but tactically aggressive in the uh, That's where I think one of the most ways we can do it. Thanks, Richard. Laura, final thoughts? You have to come up mute, though. Oh, God, I did that really awful thing, didn't I? That always happens on these things of not unmuting myself. How embarrassing. Um, yeah, so I, I really do think that so much of this has to just go back to the grassroots. And I understand and I, I do agree, you know, we ha obviously have to identify leaders. And it is really sort of great if you get somebody who's able to deliver a really good speech and can deal with the press and all of that but i personally just feel that we've we've got so much reconnecting to do in communities like the one that i live in um it, it's got to be far more just based on the organizing and to be honest just to clarify when i did call for a general strike i was fully aware that <laughs> that that wasn't going to happen in this country but um, what we do need to do moving forward is, it, it, you know, the trade unions do have to join together. We do have to create these campaigns fighting as one. We have to get um, our key focuses. We've got massive things hurtling down the road at us. The end of furlough. We've got the evictions that people are going to be facing. A second wave of COVID. We've got nurses who are out looking for, um, you know, the, a 15 percent pay rise. And, and they're not... The way they're being treated is terrible. We're seeing teachers who are being sent into schools with with no protection. My kids are in a school, and you know that. How do you keep these children in a bubble? You can't. So there are massive issues that we can be organising and building that public support as one. Um, and I think we just have to, to an extent, on the left. Um, I, I personally think we, we need to take our heads out of the space that it's been in, which has been very London centric, very, um, and it has been, the politics often I've, I've found difficult even um, being in London for, for part of the time when I was a politician. Um, and I, I think we have to really take on the challenge and understand the scale of it, get out there into communities where we need to reconnect. Um, and realise that the power lies in the people and politics is everything and everything is politics. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Tally, last minute. Well, I'm going to go back to the title. Uh, what have we learned the last five years? I, I want to encourage us to recognise in a, maybe in an accelerated way that this last five years has taught us once again the limitations of social democracy and in, in, uh, certain kind of aspects of trying to uh, democratize capitalism um, and the, the, the dead end that that's going to ultimately run us into uh, and that we begin to uh, pivot our orientation towards uh, organizing ourselves and our communities at the base uh, and again organizing on, along our own self-organizing along our own interests uh, to build our power and strength uh, it's going to take long, hard, arduous, unglamorous, unglorious work. You've got to face all the contradictions and you know crazy ideas that have infiltrated into the working class the last fifty or so years. But we have to do uh, that patient work in an accelerated way uh, to meet the future. Um, and there really is no substitute around doing that grind and doing that work. Uh, and uh, Let's get to it. Uh, but let's not walk into it under, you know, thinking that um, electoral politics, parliamentary politics, you know, uh, that is going to be the way that we are going to usher in socialism. It may be a route that we have to go through, but ultimately we have to build the power and capacity uh, to exceed that, uh, to get the, the institutional forces of capital and the state out of the way so we can meet our basic needs. Just learned that one the hard way. Mary, you get the last word. I think it's all been said. Um, all right. Uh, what have we learned over the last five years in summary? 
uh, there are no quick fixes. Uh, and right now things look pretty bleak. And I think people's decisions and actions now should be guided by what do we need to do to build a strong foundation so that we can take on the next opportunity. Uh, and that is going back to basics, essentially. I guess the other thing I'd add is it's been really hard and taken an enormous personal toll on probably everybody involved. So the other thing we should take away is look after yourselves and be nice to each other. Amen to that. Um, Mary, Callie, Laura, Richard, thank you for uh, what's been a really rich discussion. Um, thanks to everyone for joining and listening. Um, and thank you to the World Transformed for hosting us. And if you can support the World Transformed, do please do so. Um, and we'll see you at future sessions. Thank you. View the full TWT 20 program and become a supporter today to help us deliver political education all year round at theworldtransformed.org.